Oops. Hello there. So I'm Blaina. Um, some of you have met me, or probably all of you have met me if you come to my Zumba class before. And I'm here to record the session one of the happy habits that we would have been doing today in Hands That Talk for that BCS um, women's group, okay? So I'm going to take a wee sip of my tea. I'm having some peppermint tea to try and uh, reduce the swelling in my throat because most often when I take a sore throat it's usually due to acid reflux unfortunately um, and I haven't been eating very well this week so it's a possibility that that's, that's what it is but of course I'm being cautious and I'll get a PCR test later tonight as well. Um, so that's actually an example of me looking after my physical health. Um, I'm doing the things I need to do because there's a minor ailment in my physical health. And very typically, when you weren't living in a pandemic especially, um, that has always been widely acceptable, you know, um, without any judgement or without any, uh, any meaning behind it. It's just very typical that sometimes we get colds. But the Happy Habits program is really about focusing on how our mental health actually works in the same way. Our mental health needs just as much care as our physical health and if you have a body then you have physical health and if you have a mind and a brain then obviously you have mental health. Some of us get a wee bit confused about that term because um, it it's associated with mental illness or mental problems, which are both um, two separate things as well. But mental health in general is something that every individual has because of having a mind and having a brain. We all have mental health. So the Happy Habits program is really focused then on helping to encourage us to be more proactive in looking after our mental health. And... Um, the reason being is because there's a wide spectrum of mental health and there's a lot of things that fall under this category of mental health, but there's a whole spectrum of it. So each and all of us have um, the ability to be in high, positive, healthy mental health, okay? And that's kind of what we strive for, it's what we aim for, that's where we're at our best. But every single person's mental health, uh, mental health um, the wellness of your mental health goes up and down on a daily, hourly basis. So for example, I was in good tune last night, um, lovely day to myself, really good mood, and then I realized that um, what I had put out for dinner was uh, this chicken that had gluten in it and I can't tolerate gluten and had nothing else out. So then it was a wee bit delayed for me to get my dinner and then slowly but surely my mood really started to be impacted. Um, he talked about being hangry. I wasn't so much hangry but I felt really, really quite lethargic and you know I just kind of was a wee bit like moody and didn't really feel like speaking. I also didn't realise that there was something physically working on me either. At the time I wasn't experiencing any um, symptoms of physical illness as such. So there in that hour my mental health, the wellness of my mental health started to lower and it felt better after I had dinner so that was something that I did to make me feel better but also I went to my Zumba class and I enjoy it and I love the crack and when you exercise and different things you, um, your brain then gets told to release endorphins, that your brain gets told that you're happy and all. So. I started to feel mentally better. So my mental health went back up again. So that's just in one day, that's just in one evening. So every single person in the world's mental health goes up and down all of the time. Now, the Happy Habits program looks at helping us to become very resilient because there's so many different things that can impact our mental health. Um, and by being resilient, what I mean is our ability to return to our best version of our best selves as quickly as possible after um, a stressful event has taken place. So we want to really work on our resilience all the time. Like an elastic band, we want to return to, to ourselves. You know, when we can be stressed, um, we can be stretched when we're stressed and all that. And if that um, stretches too far, then you can break, you can risk a mental breakdown. Okay, now that's prolonged, that's over a long period of time. Or that's when too many significant things happen in one, one time, in a short space of time. But even when we experience those things, it's still possible to return to good, positive, healthy, oh, excuse me, mental wellness again. 
So, um, that's what we're kind of looking at. We're looking at prevention and we're also looking at returning from occasions when we have dipped down in our mental health too because that's part of being resilient. Now, if you dip really low down into your mental health, if your mental health goes really low for a prolonged amount of time, we run the risk of developing mental illness, which is different from mental problems. Mental illness can be things like depression or an anxiety disorder, which we can develop because of a lack of chemicals in our brain, or we can develop because of something changed in our life that causes us to um, to become mentally unwell, um, our thought patterns can impact how we feel and we can, our thought patterns and the things that we're doing or not doing changes the chemistry of our body as well and our actions and all that. But even with a mental illness, um, some mental illnesses are curable so we can, we can overcome depression and we can overcome anxiety disorders. Um, but some things are lifelong, things like bipolar and different things. And if you learn the skills and the tools and understand our wellness in a way that um, is about self-care and looking after your mental health in general, you can actually have a mental illness and still have positive, healthy mental health, but with a mental illness. Um, so it's just important to recognise now, of course, if you're concerned that, um, you know, you're developing a mental illness or someone that you know what is, then the recommendation is always to go to your GP and speak to them about what your options are. But these skills and this stuff here that we're going to learn is about supporting that wellness, supporting returning to wellness and different things like that. So... That is the principle and kind of the core of how the, the Happy Habits program is developed, not only to help us to feel a wee bit more, um, like, um, what would I say, like, more productive or not productive. You know how we look after our physical health without a thought and without being told and without a judgment? I want that same concept and that same... Um, attitude to be there for mental health as well because it, there's no shame in it. it doesn't mean anything about anybody um, but it's just what happens you know so moving on then the whole principle of the mental health program is based on the fact that your thoughts and your feelings and your actions all influence each other now hopefully what you'll have received on an email or maybe on whatsapp is a a page sent to you by the BCS email that shows um it might look like a triangle but there's like a circle in the background and there's three circles on the page at the top it says feelings underneath there it says physical and emotional and then there's arrows pointing back and forward to connect it to another circle that says actions and another circle that says thoughts so the whole principle of the program you might be able to hear my dogs barking they've stopped the whole principle of the program is about how our wellness, our whole well-being is influenced and impacted depending on our internal cycle of this thoughts, feelings, actions. Okay, so that's what that us as individuals. At the top of the page, it's called the internal cycle of well-being. Um, the page has a pinky background and the three circles are in a greeny blue colour. So that's the page that I would encourage you to look at at the minute. That's what I'm referring to now. So... Let's just look at that on its own for now. And that shows us that our thoughts, feelings and our actions can all influence each other. It's really difficult to pinpoint which one of those could be the starting point in terms of our well-being um, and wh which one started it off. But just for simplicity, if I started with an action to explain how this cycle can influence us, and an action was that I gave to charity then what I might think then, a thought that I might have, is that I'm a good person. So then if I think that I'm a good person, then emotionally I might feel um, happy and pleased. And whenever I have that feeling, then physically I get more energy because of the happy hormones that produce whenever we have positive thoughts and actions as well. And so then... The cycle could continue, it could go around that one way, it could go back to actions, I could be smiling, I could be skipping, I could be more friendly, I could be talking to people. 
Um, and then if I'm doing those things, then physically I am glowing and I am feeling excited. And if I'm feeling excited, then I'm thinking, oh, I can't wait to do whatever the next thing is that I want to do. Um, I want to do that again. I might come up with more ideas um, for the next fundraiser. And then my action would be to continue to do that over again. And that cycle can go either way. Actions, feelings, feelings, actions, thoughts, feelings, thoughts, actions. It can go either way um, for all of them. But it is, it's quite difficult to pinpoint which one was which. Um, and then we also have, uh, so that's an example of the, the cycle being positive. So the cycle of well-being can be positive well-being. Excuse me, do I move this week here? The cycle of well-being can be positive well-being or the cycle can actually be what is associated as being called negative well-being. So it might not be just the healthiest well-being that we could be in. And say, for example, that could start with... Um, Oh, so I shared on Facebook recently that I accidentally closed um, the the boot on my dog. And now I have to emphasize it was an accident. I was about to go to the Zumba class. I loaded my speakers under the boot. Um, I had to take off. He came out the front door, didn't know that he came out. So I didn't see him at all. It was dark in the evening. And I just went to close the boot. And he went to jump under the boot at the exact same time that I'd put it down. So that was, say, you could call that an action. I closed the bit of my dog and I thought that I was so lousy and that was so hateful and he was hurt. And now this is a whole room of different thoughts that I was having and that's a son and God love him and our a son. And I was feeling guilty and I was feeling worried and I was feeling anxious. Um, and then if I didn't have the training and the well-being tools to change that cycle there and then what I had the potential for doing was hanging back and missing my class or being late for my class to make sure that my dog was okay and to continue to beat myself up and whenever we're experiencing negative thoughts and feelings we actually reduce our energy because we put ourselves into a state of fight or flight and then our body produces cortisol and adrenaline and that's um that's really exhausting um when we're in a state of feeling negative emotions it uses more physical energy so uh, negative emotions uses more physical energy than it does to actually physically run a marathon. So I had the potential then of being late for my class, feeling negative, showing up to my class in a stress situation, not having the energy to do it well enough. Other people would have picked up on my energy and then that could have been just a bad night. But it also had the potential um, to run into the next time I had a class, my thought might have been or maybe even just the next day I could have come or that night so my action could have been that I had low energy in my class I could have been thinking oh no I'm doing bad at my class now people don't like me I could have been feeling um guilty or embarrassed or worried that they wouldn't come back and then my action might be that um I don't post about it um on Facebook anymore because I'm worried of doing it bad again which is another thought um and then that feeling could cause me anxiety and then I could I could let that run on. That negative cycle could run on and I could wait until Christmas, until something else changed that cycle for me. And it would influence my next day as well. It would influence if I went to my Zumba class and I was affronted and I was convinced that people were talking about how bad I was at that class and um, they were telling other people and I could be getting up the next day thinking, what are people thinking about me? What are they going to say? They're not going to do my class. and or oh, if people see me feeling bad and in a bad mood and all, then they might think that my program's no good and that could lower my confidence for wanting to promote myself and to continue and da 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 da. Could have ran into the next day, could have impacted everything I did. Could have made me crab it with my partner. Um, it could have made me choose to overeat or eat chocolate or eat crisps or do whatever um, because I was feeling bad to cheer myself up or because I took the mentality of I don't care about being healthy and pure rags, I just want to feel better, you know, quick fix. I, I could have led into all those things. And as I say, that cycle then of negativity can run, it can run away with you. Um, and you might not even realise it. You might not even recognise that your thought patterns are still being impacted and where it came from, where it started. But what we can do as individuals is we can consciously choose, consciously choose to change our thoughts 
our actions or to take action to change our feelings. Now our feelings is the most complex area to change. So predominantly in this program, I'll look at how to change actions or how to consciously choose actions that are positive and how to consciously recognize our thought patterns in order to change them and um, help them to promote a positive state of well-being. So actions. Now, if you were with me today, I would be asking you to think about what actions you're aware of, what are all the things that you're aware of that make us feel good and to write as many of those things down as you could think of. Now that could be things that happen every day. So for this week we could just look at what things can we do every day that make us feel good. So, cup of tea um, inside my cup actually has positive affirmations. That's something that we can do to make us feel good. Um, the most basic things that we can do up in the morning, brush your teeth, wash your face. Doing your skincare and doing your self-care activities in that way, when you're washing your face, it, um, it puts you in a state of mindfulness. We know that mindfulness is really, really calming and soothing. Um, it calms the body down. It tells us where we are. When we're focusing on washing our face and doing that, it kind of puts our thought process on what we're doing it means that not it's not like you can't think about other things while you're doing it but it makes it harder to do you can focus on just what you're doing the smells and scents um that come with your skincare for example it also comes with different aromatherapy things but for example my cleanser is made from chamomile it's chamomile balm and if you've ever noticed how people use aromatherapy and stuff what I understand from aromatherapy is that um, each scent is designed to spark a certain feeling. And so whenever I smell that scent of the chamomile, for me that's the emotion of calm. And that's what that triggers in me whenever I do that. So I start and finish both days with that feeling of calmness being set off because of practice in my skincare. So there's an action that I could do. I can use my hand cream daily, same principles, wee moment of mindfulness, smells, looking after yourself, skincare and activities like this for just serotonin. Um, you could read a book, you could talk to a friend, um, you could go a walk. So what, what the aim of our activities is, is to trigger our brain into releasing happy hormones so happy hormones are things like endorphins which is the energy hormone and it's a natural painkiller as well and oxytocin is the love hormone which strengthens the bonds in our relationships um what else do we have we have serotonin which is the key hormone required for happiness and that is produced um, well, I've seen a few studies, but each of the studies say between 70 and 90% of your production of your serotonin comes from how healthy your gut is. So you talk about your gut instinct and different things like that. Your gut is linked to your mind. Um, your subconscious mind picks up on things and you get that signal in your gut. But anyway, so... Um, an action there about producing your serotonin there's lots of other things that produce it but your eating habits so if you're eating healthily if you're eating enough even um if you're eating your meals um your sleep and you need serotonin for sleep and serotonin is produced when you're sleeping so different things to get and i'm missing one i'm missing dopamine dopamine is the hormone that we need for motivation and things that we can do to produce our dopamine is you can write a to-do list, you can tick off that to-do list and so what you'll see is um, a habit tracker in the stuff that was emailed to you. There's two versions of it. So what I encourage is that you write down as many things as you can think of um, that you can do every day that make you feel good. Drinking your water, getting a wee cup of um what other wee things can we do write in a journal take time to color in 
and the the principle of it is is what things that you can do that when they're done you know you feel good so it can be doing tasks it can be doing housework because when it's done you feel good that it's done if you have done it it can feel like a sense of accomplishment and achievement if you write down three things that day that you want to do and you tick them off that day that you've got them done um we can look at we can look at old photos um or photos of memories or talk about things that we remember that we enjoyed because our brains actually cannot differentiate between what we're thinking about and what is actually reality of what really genuinely is happening and for that reason then whatever information we are feeding our brain then then it is signaling to our brain of what to release and what to produce so if you're thinking of uh do you mind that time when we went to such and such a place and wasn't that lovely and that one was there who was good crack and you're laughing and you're smiling your brain can't tell that that's not happening now if you're looking at photos and thinking about it but your brain still goes oh we're happy oh very good very good so we're happy 100 percent, good job and let's let's have some serotonin then because we're happy let's have some oxytocin because we're thinking of fond memories between ourselves and our friend or whoever if you hug somebody for 10 seconds 10 second hug now I know this year has been hard but this is also a reason why this is so significant because um the pandemic has made it difficult to do some of the things that are essential for us to feel good and feel connection but a hug of 10 seconds is all that it takes to produce oxytocin or if you're cuddling your pet or your cat or your well a cat can be a pet but your wee cat or your wee dog or um even yourself even yourself you know 10 second wee hug oxytocin stronger bonds um endorphins is about exercise and again i'd be quizzing you here so i'd be saying to you if we were together how long do you think it takes for endorphins to be released how like in terms of doing exercise how much exercise do you think we need to do in a day at any given time for a set length of time how much exercise do we need to do to um to produce endorphins sorry just for a brain to know they release endorphins and in the recent group that i was doing the guesses were 15 minutes half an hour and an hour but actually for the production of endorphins to be triggered it only takes six minutes for your brain to go oh we're moving for six minutes now let's have some endorphins and that can be walking up and down the stairs. It can be walking to your shop and back again. Um, it doesn't have to be strenuous. You can walk back and forth between your front door and your back door for six minutes. And you get endorphins released. Obviously, the longer and the more often you do it, the more often this happens and occurs. But endorphins give us energy. With energy, we're more likely to do things we want to do. And also, it's a natural painkiller. So... Um, that's why I remember, actually I remember being at school and a lot of the girls um, would say, oh miss I can't do PE because I have my period. And I remember the teacher saying that doing exercise would heal the period pain. And I remember being like, oh, how does it? Like filling these cramps and I don't want to move and she wants me to run about a field. But right enough, Anytime I ever did do, like especially when I did camogie and stuff too, if I just wheeled on with it, I did notice a reduction in the pain of my cramps at times. Um, and now I, I do, I remember that significantly. I remember how irritated I was that she said it and I completely didn't believe her. Um, and now I can look back and think that actually is funny um, because there was truth in what she said. Although she didn't give the explanation. I just remember thinking she was just saying that because she was your PE teacher and she didn't care about you and teachers are evil and all, you know, whenever you're a teenager and that's the way you think. Um, so there you go, that's all we need. And, you know, um, a great way to get your serotonin and a, and a lot of your happy hormones is to spend time outdoors. So you could be gardening or, again, we talked there about a walk, you know, two and one and things like that. We, we need at least um, a minimum of 10 minutes outdoors um for those hormones to start to kick in 
um, but it is recommended that you have up to 30 minutes of outdoor time in a day um, for a lot of other different reasons for the way that the light impacts your mind and your cells and all things that get to you. Um, but 10 minutes, 10 minutes is a good start. So we can, we could probably achieve that. Um, so that's, that's kind of what we're looking at in terms of action. And so what I would say to you is that from this week to next week, to really, really hone in on your actions. What are the things that you're doing to make yourself feel good? Because it's really significant to do them when you least feel like doing them. Now, my mommy used to tell me when I was younger, um, if I was feeling low or do down or if I couldn't concentrate and stuff, she used to say, go and take a walk to yourself. And there was times when I was wee moody shite and I used to think, she does not care about how I feel. What would she know? And I would kind of have a huffy puff thing and I would go the walk anyway. And I would hate to admit it, but I would feel better. I would feel better. Um, and I would concentrate more and all that kind of a thing. She used to tell me, you know, I'd be stressing for my exams. And she used to tell me as well um, to go to bed at 10 o'clock because you won't take anything in after 10 o'clock um and to go to rest and I remember being worried and being panicked and being anxious and doing it anyway and realizing the next day that I knew more than I thought I did but the night before when I was exhausted um the reason I couldn't confidently g give the information to whatever it was I was learning was because I needed to rest my brain was overworked and I used to think it was just because she's old school you know I was like oh She's a hard woman, her, like she was grew up, um, she was grew up. What I should say is my mommy is, oh, I wonder how she feels about me disclosing mommy's age. Mommy's on her 70s anyway. And uh, I used to just think, you know, that was like just the way that she was brought up and, you know, she wasn't um, brought up at a time where people talked about emotions and stuff. So. You never got that chance to do it and that must be why she says to do them things instead and now i see how actually those things are so significant and so important and so essential to do especially when you don't feel like doing it because it makes you feel better so that's the trick but what i would say is just to be mindful that although we know there's certain things that make us feel better to also just be aware of um whether or not that particular thing at that particular time will make us feel the best because um sometimes we can push ourselves too much and i'll give an example of that now but i just want to explain that the reason i ask you to write down as many different examples of activities that you can do as possible is because when you have a lot of them written down now i wonder is this the same one that you got no, this one's a wee bit different. But um, when you have like a full list of activities, you know, a whole big, long, long list of all the things that you know that you can do to make you feel a bit better at all, um, and you are feeling in bad form, then you're more likely to do something that you've already written down and planned. Um, and the writing down is very significant because it, it tells our brain that it's something that we want to do and it tells our brain that we should do it and it helps to form the habit, which um, I'll explain now in a wee second. But um, it also means that because you have a plan in place, uh, because you have something recorded that you know that you can do, that you don't have to try to do all of them things in that big long list all day, every day. But on a day when you're going, oh, I'm really feeling low today or really feeling lethargic or whatever's going on for you, that you can refer to that list and come up with something that you think that you could do then to help you get by with that feeling and to improve it a wee bit. Um, because when we're in bad form, when we're feeling low, when we're crabbed and angry and annoyed and stressed, we do not want to do the things that make us feel good. And so that's why it's essential to plan them. Because when you're in bad form, you're going to go, I'm just going to sit and watch TV or I'm just going to bed or I'm just going to open that bag of crisps. And that's kind of what we do. We're in bad form. We want to go and do that. And it's harder to think of doing the thing in the moment that we know will make us feel better. It, it takes a lot of practice and discipline to get ourselves into that state. Um, 
so write the big long list of all the things that you can think of do it on a day when you're feeling grand enough to do it um as many different things and what we'll do is we'll share um different examples of activities and always mem remember to do things that you know make you feel good so if i tell you that i go to zumba two and three times a week and you don't want to do zumba two and three times a week then don't write down zumba to make you feel better because it has to be personal to you because that's what makes you feel good and again to come back to my point where I said about, um, you know, you want to make sure that thing is really going to make you feel good that day. I will give you the example where I signed up to a boot camp class um, a few weeks back or maybe it's months back now. Go on, I can't even tell. But it was um, the purpose for me to sign up for my own personal attention was about how... Um, I we were experiencing a family crisis and I wanted to feel mentally stronger and I know that in the past when I used to go to the gym and do boot camps and things that I felt that because of what you were physically doing connecting to what you were telling yourself in your mind so I decided that this would be a good thing to do and the first week I went I was absolutely buzzing after it like it was difficult and stuff because I haven't done gym work in a few years now but um I loved it. I was really excited all day. Afterwards, I was really, really buzzing. Obviously, all my happy hormones were going everywhere. And um, I decided then that the next week I should do it again to help me to feel good. But the next week on the morning that that was starting, I had a late period. It was due, overdue. And I had a family member in a really serious surgery the day before and we had got news to say that the um the the risks associated with the surgery had applied here on this occasion doesn't mean they wouldn't be undone but i still wanted to be in a place of mental strength because i was supporting family members in different ways and so i was trying my best to practice what i preach and look after my mental well-being and so I decided that this next morning that I would still go ahead to the boot camp because it would make me feel better. And remember last week when it really got everything going and I need energy now and da 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 da. So that was how I justified it. But I was a wee bit doubtful because of how I physically felt anyway because of the emotions and the lethargy and like I said, um, the physical um, energy is drained from negative emotion. And what I did was I went to the boot camp and were we 10 minutes, 15 minutes in. I was trying to do the pressing of the, what do you call it? Um, and I started to cry. And I left because I'd pushed myself too hard. What I did instead was I went and got my mommy and we went to walk in the country park. And that made me feel better. And I didn't really feel like doing that either, but it was more gentle. It was sun, sunlight, you know, it was still something that made me feel better. And I didn't go to the boot camp with the mentality of I need to do it. Um, I paid for it or what will somebody think or, um, you know, like I wasn't pushing myself. I genuinely believe that it was what I should have done. And that's what I want to say about all of our actions. So I said a minute ago when we're in bad form we do things that look back on and we say God I shouldn't have got a Chinese two nights in a row or God I shouldn't have ate that chocolate or but with everything that we do for ourselves there's a positive intention behind it and I'm going to explain this more now as I talk about the mind. Um, so there's a positive intention behind every action we choose to do and there's a positive intention behind even the feelings that we have because our feelings are a compass directing us towards what we need but in the in the format of this group and things i'm not going to go in a lot and the feelings as such um because i don't know what anybody's coming with and we don't always feel safe in a group setting to explain or to express feelings and different things so i'll not do a lot on that I'll talk over some tips and tools that can influence feelings, but I'll not go into that in depth in this program. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so there's a positive intention behind every um, every action that we have, and there's a positive intention behind every feeling that we have, because we are trying 
to cope. We are attempting to make ourselves feel better. And the reason that we do most of what we do is 70% of what we do is a habit. And the habit has grown and formed over years and years of our mind receiving messages, not just directly from someone telling you what to do, but from um, all of our senses pick up on random bits of information or all the information and feed our brain with messages that then help us to survive in this world. So our, our mammal instinct brain is all about survival. Excuse me. But our brain has evolved and developed. Um, and over the years what we have developed is this reticular activating system within our brain, it's a section of our brain that communicates between the conscious mind, which is about 10% of our mind, between the conscious mind and between the subconscious mind. So we have like a, a filter that kind of communicates back and forth between the two of them, if you like. Because um, our brain, or our, what do I say, per second we receive something like 400 billion, I think that's the direct data, um, something like 400 billion pieces of information per second but we can't process that amount of information per second because we would explode or our brain would literally go into meltdown so we've evolved by developing this filter that allows us then to look for patterns of messages and everything that's out there and form a response or form a habit or develop a neural pathway in the subconscious mind so the RAS takes the information that comes into the conscious mind and filters it down to something like 2,000 pieces of information per second because that's what we can actually process. So every person's um, concept of reality is different. And that RAS then takes those 2,000 pieces of information per second and feeds then the subconscious mind where we grow our neural pathways which is responsible for our habits. Which is why 70% of what we do is based on a habit. And so for that reason, that is why the way that we feel and the way that we act comes from a positive intention. Even though we associate it at times as being negative and we call it negative or we say that was bad or we shouldn't have or whatever. There's a positive intention behind everything that we do and it's always based on survival. And even though it, it's going, it sounds really dramatic to talk about survival whenever um, you've just dropped your phone or whenever you know somebody who you don't even like anyway didn't say hello to you the day. Our mammal instinctal, instinctive part of our brain perceives those things as threat. Our rational part of our brain is about to be like that no like that's okay we're fine we're still safe whatever but because of this being like internally kind of programmed into us if you like it's always going to be what our first instinct is. So if you see the page then that talks about the law of the body, the law of the body is that although it's difficult to pinpoint your starting point of the internal cycle of well-being, thoughts, feelings, actions, the law of the body suggests that the way that this information first of all is processed and responded to and whatever is based on a trigger taking place first. A trigger is external, it's outside of our wellness cycle and a trigger is something that happens so a trigger happens and automatically we have a thought about it now when the trigger happens it is filtered under the conscious mind going through to the RAS filter and the RAS filter searches the subconscious mind if you like to look for similar patterns of response to this chooses one and sends it back to the conscious mind and there we have an automatic thought. The automatic thought that we have, which we will always have despite learning these skills usually, will um, cause us to have a certain feeling. Now it's not the thing itself that happened that causes our feeling. It is what we thought about what happened that causes our feeling. And then our feeling then leads to how we behave, how we react, 
or what actions we take because of how we're feeling. So for this week, what I would encourage is that not only do you look at as many of the things that you can do on a daily basis to make yourself feel good as an action, and you can choose to tick them off Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or you can choose to tick that big large list, list sorry, and tick two to three things from it every day, and then every day write down, I'll do this, 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 and tick that off then if you like, whatever suits you and your learning and your productivity best. Um, that is that is an option, okay? So as well as doing that, I also encourage you now, from this week to next week, to write down, first of all, what your triggers are, and then the th one of the thoughts, one of the automatic thoughts that follow, and how that made you feel, and did you notice any change in your behaviour, or do you think the way you're acting that week might have been because of something that was a trigger, and just notice this stuff, and then ask yourself, what is the positive intention behind that thought? What is the positive intention behind that feeling, behind that action? Because sometimes it's enough to say, okay, there's a positive intention behind what I've thought. What is the positive intention? And how can I get that outcome that the positive intention is hoping for without having to react in this way without having to draw in more negative thoughts. So this week is about awareness, bringing awareness to ourselves and awareness to what we do. Because when you have a negative thought, we most of the time aren't even consciously aware of it. It's just happening. We've never stopped to question our thoughts. We believe our own negative thoughts. They make sense to us because of whatever the information is that we've received over years and years and years um, of our lives before we've ever stopped to challenge it. So we're running on automatic, we're running on autopilot and we believe our negative thoughts because they're there for our best intention even when we aren't satisfied that they are creating the best positive outcome for us. Um, but when we don't stop to question it or when we don't take awareness to a thought that we've had it can draw in more thoughts but let's say first of all you're looking for the trigger that's how we start this out you're looking for the trigger so a trigger is something that happens and that can be anything that happens it can be that your phone died which is very simple it can happen to anybody and um, it can happen a number of times a day, it's not very significant, but when it happens, it may cause you a slight amount of distress. Or a trigger can be something more significant, like a person dying. Now this week, we, um, we aren't necessarily going to directly focus on the more significant triggers, but it's just to make you aware that a trigger can be the most basic and simple thing to the more serious um, once in a lifetime kind of occasions that are still triggers that start this cycle then, this internal cycle of thoughts, feelings, actions. The triggers are the, the starting point. The triggers are the thing that usually kick starts the thoughts, feelings and actions. And then the thoughts, feelings and actions once they're kick started can just continue in their own wee cycle then as they go. So triggers, dropping your phone, um, now, let's use that as my example. You could drop your phone and you could think, my phone is broke. Now, I'm focusing on the part where you haven't lifted your phone yet. You haven't checked to see if it's broke, but maybe you've dropped it. And that's an automatic thought that you have. Now, mm, my tea's cold. Now, <laughs> if... The thought that you had, right, let, let's go with this hypothetical that you drop your phone, you think it's broke, and you feel panicked, but you haven't lifted it yet to check. Within a few minutes, within a few seconds, that thought will keep on trying to get your attention. And it will bring in more thoughts. Your phone's broke. <gasps> Panic. Instantly. 
do nothing about it for a second. Oh my god. Even even in the process of you bending down to get it and pick it up, your brain could go, Oh no, my phone's broke. Uh, if I have a broke phone, nobody can reach me. What if something bad happens to somebody? Oh, and such and such a one sick too. And what about the wains at school? And oh my goodness, do you know what? If nobody can get me, then I better not go out of the house because they'll have to ring the house phone. And I, now I'll not be able to go to that thing that I really want to go to. And do you know what? If I if my phone's broken, I need a new phone. I'm, I can't afford it. I can't afford a new phone because it's coming up to Christmas. And you know, it's been a hard year and, and such and such a one and this year and that there. And that's more than one automatic thought. But if you don't bring awareness to the thought that you have originally, then more will come. And that will continue to cause you to feel panic, anxiety, worry, um, all of those things. You can feel those things instantly. Um, but when we recognize an automatic thought that we've had, <gasps> my phone's broke, we can go, oh, what's the positive intention behind that thought? Well, the positive intention behind that thought is that I want to prepare for the worst case scenario, which right now in this occasion is that my phone is broke, so that I know what to do in order to resolve the situation. And um, we perceive it as a threat because of what we associate it with if people can't connect with us because for survival we rely on social connection and so although it seems really basic and as it might sound completely out of the ballpark to even say your thinking is based on survival if you drop your phone that might sound completely ridiculous to your rational brain but to your mammal instincts it is about survival it is with our best interest at heart but that panic and that worry and all of that that can continue and lead to um, worry and anxiety and stress and whatever can prolonged over a certain amount of time lower our mental health and not only that but if that is not something that you're able to challenge and recognize and prevent from drawing in more negative thoughts then the impact that the negative event and the negative feelings has on you is more significant than necessary um meaning that you know it impacts all areas of your life again because then how you feel influences how you act and how you behave um but the whole purpose of recognizing what we're thinking and bringing awareness to it and recognizing the positive intention is so that we don't have unnecessary negative reactions to things that will in turn influence our negative well-being or, or well-being in general um and if that's the way that you respond to one simple thing like breaking your phone and you don't know how to challenge and change that thought before the event where you find out that your phone's not broke um, then it will influence your feelings and then that will influence the next thing that happens. So if the next thing that happens is you're meant to be going to an appointment and you're running late or somebody who's left you as in the air in time or um, maybe you kick your toe or maybe you burn your toast or you know the automatic thought is always going to be there all of the time but when we don't recognize how to bring awareness to it and then challenge it there and then or maybe later on it's, that's how we'll start out we'll practice later as opposed to in the moment um then then it actually does bold up and bold up so all those things that seem insignificant and not a big deal and sure how would drop your phone if anything to do with your mental health it's about all of those things as a cluster as a as a combined amount of events that happen and cause small short bursts of negative feelings but then they bold up and they bold up and they bold up and they bold up and they bold up, bold up until the next seemingly small and significant trigger or thing that happens takes place and you have bought up all of these small and significant feelings of negativity and so when you receive another one again it feels overwhelming and it feels unbearable and your behavior and your reaction might not match what has actually taken place and later you might look back and say god why did i do that or why did i say that for um and the reason why you might have just been because all these things were building up on you and how you felt at that time was genuinely how you were feeling. So I'm saying your reaction um, might appear to have been um, out, of line, out of alignment with what did happen. But for you, it wasn't out of alignment because that was your reality at that time. But we tend to look back in hindsight and say, you know, I really didn't have to respond in the way that I did. That's okay. But these tools and these things that we're going to look at now um, over the next few weeks are going to help us then to not respond in that way. So 
if you're choosing consciously to do positive actions as consistently and as often as possible, then what you're doing is you're feeding neural pathways that are new positive habits, especially when you do them when you don't feel like doing them, because your brain then is told to release the happy hormones that we need in order to feel better. If we're already feeling better when something happens to us, if a trigger takes place, on that day it might not negatively impact our well-being when we're feeling good and positive because we have done actions that produce happy hormones in our brain then it's so much easier to think happy positive thoughts and so the cycle can be um the cycle can then be positive and equally if we're bringing awareness to what the thoughts are that we have then what we can do then because we're having more positive thoughts is we're more likely to do positive actions which makes us feel better so that's the homework for this week homework if you like what you're going to do is as many positive actions as you can especially when you don't feel like doing it if you know that it's definitely going to make you feel better excuse me and the other one is to write down your triggers you don't have to do it there and then you can do it that night or you can do it once a week or you can do it every couple of days look back and say what happened? Why was I feeling that way that day? What happened? What thought did I have about what happened? Um, what feeling did that cause? And then how was I acting then because of how I felt? So that is what I encourage you to do this week. And remember, there's a positive intention behind our thoughts. Try to see if we can identify what it is. Do this as little as, or as often as you like. But the most significant impact that you will see on your well-being is when you consciously choose to do this stuff intentionally on purpose. And when we write things down, when I talked there earlier about um, creating new neural pathways to form new positive habits, physically writing something down, um, I can't remember the statistic, but it's like something like 10,000 something or others that form neural pathways. 10,000 wee connectors that create the neural pathway that you're trying to form in order to have the habit. Um, it's more effective and stronger when you physically handwrite something down. So handwrite your thought and handwrite your action. And then it's more embedded in your brain then to say that you're going to and you want to do it. And your brain will try to find easy ways to make that happen when you tell it that that's what you want. So your brain will give out whatever you put on. So now we want to consciously become aware of what we're putting on, what we're feeding it and allow our brain then to feed that back to us sometimes when we need to. It doesn't happen overnight. This is a habit that we're trying to develop. We need to practice something or hear a piece of information at least six times in order for the seed to be planted. First of all, when we do it 21 days consistently in a row, then the pathway starts to grow. And actually, if you do it for 66 days consistently in a row, then what happens is you have a strong bond of a neural pathway there. So it sounds very simple and straightforward and it might be something you're already in the practice of. But just to become aware that it doesn't change everything significantly overnight. It can change your mood for a day or two and then the next day you might return to the automatic stuff. And it might take you to another day to say, whoops, I should have or I could have or... Um, and that's okay this is all about practice it's all about practice and it does it just takes a bit of hard work and that's okay that's okay we can do it hard work that's simple but hard to do in the moment so we just want to practice it as much as we can now imagine you were with me um how long it would have taken me to tell you all that because i just rambled away and rambled away but anyway thank you so much for your time and i hope to be well enough to see you next week again okay take care now bye bye